Mick Myers has been homeless for many years, but it hasn't always been that way. As the years went by, the world forgot who he was, but after roaming around without an identity for so long, he ran into a cop who took Myers on an unimaginable journey to find himself. Like most homeless people, Mick Myers was often ignored as he roamed around the streets of Hayward in Almeda County, California. Most of the people just hurry by and don't even give me a glance, Myers told KPIX5. But someone had noticed him, and it was too late to avoid him. Myers didn't have a lot on his schedule, so he spent most of the time panhandling near a freeway on Foothill Boulevard in Hayward, but he had drawn some unwanted attention from the police. Myers had run into Almeda County Deputy Sheriff Jacob Swalwell numerous times before. The officer warned him about panhandling near the busy freeway, but he didn't listen so Swalwell was forced to take action. For years, Swalwell had seen the homeless man begging drivers for money, and he was fed up with it. Now, most people would say that the officer was harassing this poor man, but Swalwell had a different objective. It's a safety issue, and that was more of a concern than the panhandling, Swalwell told ABC7. He was ready to write Myers a ticket, but something the man said made him reconsider. And I asked him for his ID, and he said he didn't have an ID, and I immediately asked, why don't you have an ID? Swalwell told KPIX5. And when Myers explained his situation, the officer's heart sank. Got to know him pretty quickly and realized that a citation's not what this man needs, Swalwell told ABC7. But what was it that Myers needed? To figure that out, the officer had to know more about him. At the time, the 60-something-year-old man told Swalwell that before he was homeless, he used to work as a truck driver, but an accident left him disabled. He spent a year in a wheelchair and another year in crutches. But when Myers got back on his feet, he encountered some difficult hurdles. He started working in manufacturing, but that didn't pan out. Then he tried working in the food industry, but lifting things and being on his feet all day led to excruciating pain. So he took his life in a dark and desperate direction. Unable to work, he started panhandling. He does it three times a day, Swalwell told ABC7. He's not panhandling for alcohol or drugs, he's panhandling to stay alive. But what did he use the money for? Myers walked around to the intersection's four lanes as the lights changed until he grabbed $5 or $10 from generous drivers. Then he walked to McDonald's or Wendy's to eat, but the officer was going to put a stop to his routine. What's it gonna take for you to get off the street? Swalwell asked, and Myers replied, well, a government check would do it, but I can't seem to get one. To get a check, he needed something he hadn't had in a while. Myers needed a state-issued ID to get benefits, so Swalwell offered him a ride to the DMV. But the men encountered a major problem. I'm no longer in the system, Myers said. I don't exist anymore, according to the DMV. And he didn't have what he needed to get one either. Myers needed a birth certificate and proof of residency to get a California ID card, but he was adopted and never met his biological parents, so Swalwell had to reach out to the home of a higher power to prove his case. Swalwell got a letter from a church claiming that Myers resided in Hayward, California, but the mystery deepened when the officer acquired the homeless man's birth certificate from Highland Hospital, where Myers was born. He discovered that the name on the birth certificate was Gordon Michael Myers, but it took three trips to the DMV before he got his California senior citizen card. Myers held it up and took a selfie with Swalwell, which spread like wildfire on Facebook. I walked in McDonald's to eat breakfast and the guys I usually sit with go, hey, you're famous, man, and whipped out his phone and there I am on his phone, Myers told ABC7. But what about his social security check? All the attention he got on Facebook led to a couple of job offers. Plus, he's now a step closer to acquiring his government benefits. In the process, Swalwell might have changed the way law enforcement treats homeless people. Sergeant Ray Kelly also told ABC7, I think we're gonna bring it to all our trainings and say, hey, if you have the ability to do something like this, let's go ahead and do it. Myers hopes other law enforcement officers will treat the homeless like a friend, the way Myers did. But luckily for Myers, the publicity was about to change his life once again. 
a private investigator of 25 years named Mark Askins had seen Meyer's story on KPIX 5. He kept saying, I'm lonely, I don't have anybody in my life, said Askins, so he volunteered to connect him with his loved ones. Meyer's adoptive mother was very nurturing, but he didn't get along with his adopted siblings. So when she passed away, they cut him off and he became a loner. But Askins and a non-profit group was about to change all that. Askins works as an investigator with Miracle Messages, a group that reconnects homeless people with loved ones. There's always somebody in our lives who we think about as we fall asleep at night on their birthdays, said Askins. Could this great man help Myers find his real mother? Myers knew his biological family's name was Oakley and that his birth mother's first name was Marie. But could she be alive after all this time? He gave Askins permission to find out. And after some digging, he finally had a eureka moment. The investigator managed to locate his 85-year-old mother about 300 miles up north. As a child, Myers had a hole in his stomach, but his mother, Marie Pauline Oakley, couldn't pay for his medical needs, so her mother convinced her to give the boy up for adoption so he could get the surgery he needed. But when Askins reached out years later, it eventually led to the sweetest and most heartbreaking mother and son hug ever. Oakley and Myers spoke on the phone first. This is David Charles Oakley, Myers said over the phone, and his mother cried out, my son. Eventually, he flew over to Humboldt County to meet his mother for the first time in 65 years. Not only had he found his mom, but his whole family, which meant he was no longer alone. Who'd have thought that something like this could have happened to anybody, let alone me, said Myers. Melissa Smith from San Diego, California, had seen the pregnant beggar asking for money several times at the Eastlake Plaza during the weekend. The woman often held a sign that read, please help, and plenty of people did, but they had unknowingly been fooled. I felt bad, there's a pregnant lady with a little boy who's down on her luck, Smith told ABC 7's sister station, KGTV, but she had no idea that the woman wasn't really what she appeared to be. Some panhandlers will just sit passively by a main road while holding a sign, hoping that someone will give them money. Others might take a more active stance and approach a vehicle or an individual to beg for money, but some of them barely make enough money to pay for one meal a day. Statistically speaking, most panhandlers only collect about $25 on a daily basis. About 94% of that money is used on food, but there are some folks who might find other not-so-noble uses for their cash. Most people give beggars money because they assume the person will use it to buy food. But some beggars spend their earnings on alcohol or controlled substances, which understandably helps them cope with the awful situation they're in. This is one of the reasons why so many people tend to ignore a cry for help. And even though there are tons of people on the streets who rely on the kindness of strangers, there's one panhandler who was willing to do anything to get what she wanted. It's not easy to turn away from a pregnant woman with a child holding a sign asking for help. When Melissa Smith first encountered the woman, she gave her all of her spare change she had on hand. It broke her heart that anyone should ever have to suffer like this woman did, but Melissa didn't realize that she was being played. The East Lake Village Center had grocery stores, restaurants, dentists, salons, clothing stores, and more. So there were people walking around with lots of loose change in their pockets, but the pregnant beggar didn't realize that Smith was keeping tabs on her. After all, it wasn't easy to blend in with others when you're pregnant and living on the streets. In the span of five minutes, Smith witnessed five different people give the pregnant beggar some cash. Her heart went out to the woman in distress, but little did she know that the beggar was not that innocent or that broke. She had seen the woman wearing dirty and stained clothes while standing in the scorching sun. On occasion, she saw a man with them and assumed it was the beggar's husband or the father of her child. But then the woman slipped up in a really obvious way. One day, Smith was getting gas at the station in the shopping plaza when she spotted the woman with her son at her usual spot. And then Smith saw something that made her question her own sanity. Was the poor, helpless, soon-to-be mom scamming everyone? Smith refused to believe it at first. After a while, the woman and her son headed towards a Mercedes-Benz. 
but Smith didn't assume it was her car because a beggar couldn't afford such an expensive vehicle. Smith couldn't help but wonder if the couple was planning on stealing the vehicle. But there was another explanation that would soon make itself known that made Smith's blood boil with anger. Smith continued to watch what appeared to be a car theft in progress, but the beggar opened the vehicle with ease as if she owned the seemingly new car, and then she drove off with the man and her son. But this wouldn't be the last time Smith would run into her. Smith would end up seeing them again very soon. Smith shook her head in disbelief and eventually got in her car and drove off, but a short time later she noticed the Mercedes-Benz was right in front of her on the street. Smith's jaw dropped to the floor when she realized that the beggar, the man, and the son were counting their money and laughing, but sadly there was a sinister reason behind their laughter. Smith followed them as they drove to a McDonald's at a plaza on Bonita Road. But they weren't there to order burgers and fries, they were there to work the crowd over. Once Smith realized what they were doing, she was hopping mad. The beggar put up her help sign while her partner parked the Mercedes, and in under five minutes, people were falling for her tricks. She was a scam artist, but Smith wasn't about to let her get away with it. Smith took photos of the woman and the boy, but the beggar spotted her, got angry, and started shouting at her. And then the pregnant woman did something that was pretty unusual for a person in her condition. Next thing I know, she picked up this big boulder, Smith said. I don't know if pregnant people can do that, but it was pretty big over her head and she was coming at me with this rock," Smith told KJTV. Smith was in trouble, but she wouldn't be for too long. Another eyewitness saw the entire altercation and called 911, but the couple had fled by the time the police arrived. Fortunately, Smith had written down the beggar's license plate number and gave it to KJTV. The station soon started hunting the woman down, but sadly they hit a roadblock. The TV station ran the plates and immediately found the address to the woman's apartment in Encinitas, California. Unsurprisingly, no one answered when reporters came knocking on her door. But a woman later called the station and told them she had moved into the apartment after the previous tenants left abruptly. And then someone spotted the panhandler and reported it to the authorities. Emily Valdez, a reporter at a local news station, got a tip that someone had finally seen the pregnant beggar. So she approached the woman and showed her the photo Melissa Smith had taken, but the beggar simply responded by saying that she didn't speak English. So Valdez turned to the woman's partner for answers. The man claimed he didn't know what Valdez was talking about and then started talking to the beggar in an unfamiliar language before they fled the scene. But the reporter followed them anyway and quickly discovered that they weren't driving a luxurious car anymore. The panhandlers escaped in a minivan with their kids, who weren't even wearing their seatbelts. Despite Valdez's best efforts, the couple got away with the scam and the case went cold again. But then an ex-detective shed a light on the mysterious panhandler's identity. Leslie Albright, a former San Diego Police Department detective, had seen Valdez's interview with the fake panhandlers and realized that the man was speaking Romani. She had been trying to disband an organized crime ring of gypsies for years. Unfortunately, they remained at large and the beggars Valdez had spoken to weren't what they appeared to be. Detective Albright believed that the man and woman were just co-workers and the pregnancy was a scam orchestrated by the organization they worked for. And she warned that they or others like them will continue to do this until they are brought to justice. There is a way to avoid becoming one of their victims. Homeless advocates suggest giving money to reputable charities like soup kitchens, shelters, and thrift shops, as opposed to giving money directly to beggars. This is a lesson that Smith and others in her community will keep in mind the next time they see someone asking for a handout. 